So have you ever had this experience where you realize one day that you've heard a song many times but you've never really listened to it? Do you know what I'm talking about? That happened to you? Maybe in today's world where people more often buy and download specific songs for their collection, maybe it perhaps doesn't happen quite so much, but have you ever caught yourself at some point actually listening to a song that maybe you've heard countless times on the radio and all of a sudden it's like it breaks into your consciousness? You know, back in the good old days of eight tracks, do you remember eight tracks? <laughs> oh, the old people are like, yes. I was really small. I barely remember eight tracks. Eight tracks and records and then cassette tapes. Wasn't it amazing when they came out with cassette tapes so small? You know, but I think one of the greatest technological advances of all time, hands down, was when they invented the automatic reverse, the continuous play. If you had a stereo in your car that you didn't have to like take out the tape and turn it around, it just kept, can you imagine music just playing over and over and over again? Isn't that an amazing thing? Everybody under 30 is like, yeah, it's normal. Back in those days, eight tracks, records, cassette tapes, and even, even with CDs, that kind of thing could happen quite easily. You would have maybe many albums in your collection because you, know, you knew and you liked one or two songs that were popular, or maybe you liked the artist or the group. And while you maybe have played a record or a tape or a disc many times, all of a sudden one day you find yourself actually listening to the words and the music of a song that you hadn't particularly paid attention to before. That's what happened with me, with this song that I would like to share with you and reflect on today. I was all alone, involved in the long journey home from Willowdale Church to my home, which is like four kilometers, but can take a long time. So I was, I was driving back from church one day, I don't know when this was, a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, somewhere in the last, I don't know, three or four months. And uh, I happened to have Michael W. Smith's 2004 Healing Rain CD in the player. And you know, I think 2004, that's, that's, that's pretty modern. But then I realized for some of you here, that's like before you were born. But it's really not so far ago. But anyways, I, I ha happened to have that in the player and for whatever reason, maybe you can call it distracted driving, I don't know what it was, but for whatever reason, I found myself actually paying attention to and listening to one of the tracks that I had heard many times before. A song called I Am Love. And I don't know, you know how sometimes all of a sudden you hear a song and I became intrigued to listen to it again when I got home and, you know, pull out the CD sleeve and actually try to read. They always have crazy graphics, but try to read the lyrics and see what was going on. And in one sense, I found the song a bit puzzling because it wasn't immediately clear to me whether this song was mostly a personification of the quality of love, you know, as if love as a person could describe itself. Hi, I'm love, and this is what I'm like. I wasn't sure if that's really what the song was about, or was it really a song seeking to express the sentiments, thoughts, and words of Jesus Christ? In other words, a song written from his perspective. So, let me read the lyrics, and then I'll share with you what I've concluded about them. The song called I Am Love, this is how it goes. I am not passers-by. I am not a white lie. And I am not left to die. I am love. I am love. I am not feeling sad. I am not the new fad. And I am not quickly mad. I am love. I am love. I am not standing by. I am not letting go. And I am not leaving you. I am love. I am love. You can try to hide, you can try to run, but you'll never run far enough. This is my flesh, this is my blood, and I am love. You can fly up high, you can dig down deep, you can flee to the west or flee to the east, but you can't escape what I've done because I am love. My blood fell like rain, I did not bleed in vain. But from my veins, I am love. I am love. So I spent some time listening to that song and pondering and reflecting on its lyrics. 
And as I've done so, I've come to appreciate it more and more. And I've also come to the conclusion that I think this really is a song about Jesus and his love and his sacrifice. And that's what the communion service is really all about. So I believe this is really a good communion song. And I'd like to use it as a base today in which to focus our thoughts in this service, kind of build around the words in that song. Because in thinking about it and trying to say, what is this song really about? It made me think about God's love. The simple phrase emphasized throughout the song is, is simply the words, I am love. And that should immediately bring to our minds the straightforward words of John recorded in the Bible in 1 John chapter 4, where John states in verse 8 and repeats again in verse 16 those words that we know well, God is love. Of course, God, and by extension Jesus, as one person of the triune Godhead, is more than just love. But it is appropriate to say God is love. It is appropriate for Jesus to be able to say, I am love. From the perspective that all that he is and everything that he has done and is doing is consistent with love. It's of the essence of love. It's infused with love. It's, it's all in the setting and in the spirit of love. Every single aspect, every single act of God is in the realm and with the characteristics of love. Ironically, sometimes it's actually kind of difficult to know how to talk to Christian believers about God's love. Maybe my fellow pastors, we even have a, can we call you a former one? <laughs> former Pastor Kevin. I'm glad that Pastor Kevin and Edelweiss are here. And Pastor Jake. And Pastor Ida is preaching in Ottawa today. But maybe they could um, concur with me that Ironically, sometimes it's difficult to know how to talk to Christian believers about God's love. And I think that's because maybe we're so familiar with the idea, we're so comfortable with the concept. Yeah, Jesus loves me, of course. I know that. But let me go ahead and try anyways. Let me do so by reviewing the aspects of love as described in this song and portrayed in the life of Christ Jesus. As we prepare to share in this communion together, I want to invite you to choose right now to think, to intentionally think about the love of Jesus. Something that, yes, you might know about, but think about it. The song says, I am not passers-by. Jesus and his love is not impersonal, not fleeting, not temporary, and of no consequence or impact like a person who may be momentarily or intentionally passes by. I am not a white lie. Christ is not just a harmless, polite little concept of no real significance, an accepted non-reality not worth challenging. He is not any kind of lie and neither is his love. In fact, he's recorded saying in John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am not left to die. He and his love are not something disposable, something past due and past use, something finished and done. His continuous life means continuous love, fresh and relevant. And I am not feeling sad. Jesus is not just a feeling or an emotion, some kind of emotional or spiritual crutch for people who can't handle life on their own. He is so much more than that. His love isn't just for when you're feeling down, but it's for all of life, every aspect. And I am not the new fad. The Lord is lasting, principled, relevant over the long term. No matter in what season of life or in what era you engage with his love, it will be valuable, it will be beneficial, it will be pleasant, and it will be beautiful. He's not necessarily the latest thing, and he doesn't require current popularity in society to be of value. The life and salvation he offers is something that is based on more than the fleeting and fickle whims of a society with a short attention span, you know? Oh, I like Jesus. Oh, now I like someone else better. He was my BFF for 30 seconds. Oh. No. Far from temporary, he has staying power. He is permanent. And I am not quickly mad. This brings to mind the profound description of love recorded in 1 Corinthians 13, where it says this in verses 4 and 5, love is patient and kind. 
Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable, and it keeps no record of when it has been wronged. Jesus is not easily offended or run off or in a snit. Thank God for his mercy and his grace. Thank God for his calmness. I am not standing by. When it comes to Jesus and his love for us, he is involved, connected, and engaged. He is active and not passive, not on the sidelines, not just waiting, but taking initiative. He is not indifferent to our needs and our qualities, not just a spectator, but someone with skin in the game, literally. But along with these aspects already mentioned, there are some concepts highlighted in this song which really focus, I think, on the loyalty of Christ and on the extensive reach of his love. And I'd like to look at those. The song says, I am not letting go, and I am not leaving you. The love of Jesus here is portrayed as being tenacious. I mean, he hangs on, and he does not, he will not abandon us, even if challenged, even if threatened. This is loyal love from a loyal Lord. He is in it with us for the long haul, as in an eternally long haul. And yes, we can reject, we can push him away, we can resist his love, but that does never, ever stop him from taking the initiative of love towards us. He comes to us and he stays. He doesn't walk away because he's committed. He is devoted, he's loyal, and he is true to his covenant. The description of love in 1 Corinthians 13 includes this in verse 7, love never gives up and endures through every circumstances. Guaranteed 100% of the time, you will always walk away from God before he ever walks away from you. That is a fact. You can try to hide, you can try to run, but you'll never run far enough. You can fly up high, you can dig down deep, you can flee to the west or flee to the east, but you can't escape what I've done. Simply put, You can't escape or evade his love. It reaches you whoever and wherever and whenever you are. The merits of Christ's life, love, and sacrifice reach every single person, whether they're aware of it or not, whether they're open to it or not, whether they accept it or not. His sacrifice will find you. His sacrifice will reach you because the ripple of his love spreads beyond all all humanity. You are free to reject it, yes, but you cannot ever be outside the realm of its reach. There is no way to sidestep it or escape it. His love will include you. I was talking to a man a few, I don't know, weeks or months ago, and just talking on the phone. He never met me, never saw me, but he insisted on referring to the Christian God as the white man's God. And he wasn't saying it very positively. He was like, yeah, the white man's God. Bless his heart, he was so wrong. He was so wrong. Because God is not the exclusive domain of any one skin color or any one language or any one race. He's not the God for just one segment of society. In other words, if you have ever been a human being, which looks like most of you, looks like all of you, then the love of, the love of Jesus has extended all the way to you. That's the fact. All the way to you. And when you embrace and accept that love, then it is incredibly reassuring to know that nothing external can pull you apart from that love. Nothing can pull you apart from him. That's what makes the words read in our scripture reading so beautiful, so powerful that everyone read from us. And I want to I know it's communion Sabbath and we're always late and all that stuff, but I still want to go to the Word of God and just read this again from that scripture reading. Romans 8. We'll start at verse 38. Romans 8, 38. It's talking about the Christ who loved us. And Paul says, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't and life can't. The angels can't and the demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. 
Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is, re- that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So yeah, we've made a lot of assertions here, and statements about Jesus and the quality of his love. Okay, but where's the proof? Where's the real life evidence? And that's what is hinted at in the song, I think, when it says, but you can't escape what I've done. Because it's fine to proclaim, I am loved, but what have you done to show it, right? Who wants to be loved without any evidence? And it's, it's really the part of the song that what first caught my attention, driving up Bathurst. It's what I've come to especially appreciate about this piece of music, because... This is the part of the song where it climaxes. And yet it's also the part of the song where it very gently and quietly ends. And it's this focus on the greatest evidence, the most potent display and proof of Jesus Christ's love. The part that says, this is my flesh. This is my blood. My blood fell like rain. I did not bleed in vain, but from my veins, I am love. The life and the death, the sacrifice of Jesus for you and me. I mean, come on, how better, how more powerfully and perfectly could God have possibly revealed and proved his life, his love? What else do you want? What greater evidence of his love, what greater act could Jesus have possibly done to provide assurance of his love for us? What could he do to show it more? John 15, 13 records the words of Jesus. He said, the greatest love is shown when people lay down their lives for their friends. But Christ took it way, way up above, several notches above that. 1 John 4, 10 says, this is real love. It is not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Only God can rightfully say, I am love. The love of Jesus is beyond comprehension. Without any sense of regard or care on our part, he was willing to innocently lay down his perfect, eternal, divine life to give us a hope, give us a chance, give us a reason to love. Thinking about the love of Jesus revealed in his selfless sacrifice is simply awe-inspiring. It is humbling and yet ennobling all at the same time. And what's so amazing is that he, he does not see his sacrifice as love as being in vain in spite of the fact that the harsh reality is that it seems the majority of humans, they trash and ignore his love. And yet, It's like if you alone accept it so that you can be saved from sin's lifeless end and enjoy an eternity in loving relationship with him, then then if you alone will accept that, then he considers it all worth it. He doesn't consider his love to be wasted if it's just you and a couple of other people. Because it's what he does, it's what he is. And his loving sacrifice was more than enough to accomplish the salvation of every human being ever. And when you and I accept that and value that loving sacrifice, then Christ's blood did not fall in vain. It's like Jesus is saying to us, I am love. I love you. How can I show you and convince you of just how deeply I love you? Here, how about this? My flesh and blood. Blood poured out from my own veins for you. You know the words, this is my flesh, this is my blood, they should remind us of the account recorded in the Bible in John 6 where Jesus is talking to some people there in verse 53. And he said something kind of strange. He said, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. That's different. And oh, how intensely much more meaning those statements took on following the Last Supper meal when Jesus used the bread and the grape juice of the Passover meal to represent the personal, physical sacrifice of his body and blood given in love. All of a sudden, what he said started to make more sense. And it's what we focus on. It's what we contemplate. It's what we celebrate. It's what we luxuriate in as we share together in this communion service. 
I love how Ellen White described the effect Jesus Christ's loving sacrifice should have on us. This is from the second volume of her Testimonies for the Church books, page 213. She wrote there, The scenes of Calvary call for the deepest emotion. Upon this subject, you will be excusable if you manifest enthusiasm. Some of you look enthusiastic. Some of you look the absolute antithesis of enthusiasm right now. But think about Jesus. That Christ so excellent, so innocent, should suffer such a painful death, bearing the weight of the sins of the world, our thoughts and imaginations can never fully comprehend. The length, the breadth, the height, the depth of such amazing love, we cannot fathom. The contemplation of the matchless depths of a Savior's love should fill the mind, touch and melt the soul, refine and elevate the affections, and completely transform the whole character. That's what should happen when we think about Jesus' love. Jesus says, I am love, and here's my sacrifice, my very flesh and blood to show it. So if we don't leave here a little bit changed today, you know, if, if, if after thinking about Christ's love and sacrifice, if we aren't a little bit more enthusiastic about our Lord, if we aren't a little bit more filled with awe, if we aren't a little deeper in our love for Jesus, it's not his fault. Like, what else do you want him to do? Oh, yeah, I know you love me. No, really. What else? There's nothing more astounding and profound and loving that he could do, which means it's up to you and me to choose to allow Christ's love to lift our affections even a little bit higher, a little bit closer to him. And that's why we have this service. That's why we do this. Is it just a ritual? Because we hope that can happen as we intentionally take that time to think about Christ's loving sacrifice. We hope that it, it draws us to him. So in a few minutes, we're going to move to different places in the building. We're going to share in the foot washing service, and then we're going to reassemble here for the final part of our worship experience. So we're not quite done, so just relax, but let me give some instructions before we close this portion of our program. The communion service is meaningful for those who love Jesus and have connected their lives to him. That means that anyone who's made that life commitment is welcome to participate in the communion service. If you're a visitor to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and you're thinking, I don't know, I'm not sure if I'm ready to do this communion thing. No problem. You don't have to actively take part. But we do welcome you to stay by and watch what goes on and continue to worship with us. Kind of feel free to look over our shoulders, so to speak. And if you have a question, any Christian should be able to help answer the question. So in a few minutes, we're going to go our different ways. The men meet in the upper room. The ladies meet in the youth chapel. It's there in your bulletin. Merry couples who choose to do it together in the fellowship hall. Children's story takes place here. We're going to go our separate ways and then come back together, hopefully. But before we end... I have my note I always have to remember to say when you're coming back in, the deacons are there again with the offering bags. That's not in case you missed it the first time. It's a special offering we take up at communion time for our benevolent fund to help people in unexpected times of need, both within and outside of our church community. But before we do all that, before we separate for the foot washing service, I want to invite you to listen to this song. You know, I tried to find a soundtrack and none were available, and I think that's maybe a good thing because I suspect that some of you maybe particularly wouldn't enjoy the music. You know, everybody has different music they like, and I'm sure some of you wouldn't like the music. So maybe it's just as well. But I was able to buy the music. And I'll say again how thankful I am to my wife Sandra and my friend Shankar for their willingness to yet again prepare a song that I've come up with on fairly short notice. I can uh, always count on them, which is buying myself a favor for the future. I can always count on them to help out with this song. So I, I, I want you to hear this song. And as you listen to this song, I want to encourage you to take the opportunity to think about Christ's sacrifice. Think about the love that is seeping and oozing from that sacrifice. 
and allow yourself to get lost in it. Use this time to prepare your heart and mind to participate meaningfully in our communion service. I am love.